thank you everyone for coming out. I know it's like the end of the day, but I'm glad you guys are here. And so my name is Danielle McGeary. I'm the Vice President of Healthcare Technology Management um, from Amy. Um, I've been at Amy a little over three years now. Prior to that, I did work in the field for 10 years, so I'm not, you know, I do have experience. I've faced a lot of the same challenges you all are facing. And um, so I started my career. I have a bachelor's and master's in biomedical engineering from the University of Connecticut. And um, do you need one? Um, and um, I did that clinical engineering graduate program, and I started my career at Hartford Hospital. I was there for seven years, started as an intern, worked my way up. I was a clinical engineer, project management, did a lot of medical equipment planning for all of their new towers they were putting up. Then I got the opportunity to go over to the VA, um, and I was their director of clinical engineering for the five VA hospitals in Massachusetts and all their TBOC. And then I did a short stint at Aramark. I went to the third party side. I was a district manager for about for about two years there. I had a territory in the Northeast from Maine down to DC. I was west of Michigan, had about 40 accounts. Um, and yeah, so I have a decent amount of experience in the field. So I was brought on. Um, everything we do at Amy HTM, we have three strategic initiatives. We're elevating the field, we're standardizing the field, and promoting the field. So everything that we'll talk about today kind of aligns back to those three core missions. And I just always like to start off by saying that, you know, everything we do at Amy comes from the field and our volunteers. We have an army of volunteers that help make all these projects come to life. Um, just don't think for a second I'm doing it on my own. You know, we wouldn't have the Amy HCM program without everyone in the field who's so passionate about it. And if anyone ever wants to get involved, you know, whatever, from whatever time committee you have, there's always an opportunity. We also have committees, um, like the Technology Management Council and the Healthcare Technology Leadership Committee that you need to apply to and be selected to be on. Um, and it's just a great way to give back. But on a smaller scale, everything we do is come from suggestions from the field. So don't ever be afraid to speak up, give suggestions. Um, we're going to talk about the Dean at Apprenticeship Leader, and that came from a suggestion from um, a person in the field, and it came to life. So, you know, that's probably a huge scale, you know, initiative, but we were able to do it with an army. There's over 100 people that helped contribute through the development of the curriculum, about 50 hospitals that wrote letters of recommendation for the Department of Labor. So it's a huge, everything we do is a huge undertaking, and we can't do it without all of you. So if anyone here has ever volunteered or helped us out, we are just so appreciative. So a little, so this is kind of our um, overview. And so just really quick, I'm sure many of you know about Amy. Um, we're, we focus on all health technology, so we are broad. We, do, we are a standards-based organization. We have over 400 standards from everything from cochlear implants to nursing, clinical standards, sterilization. Um, that's our biggest um, area in Amy, and a lot of people don't realize that because I know before I worked at Amy, I always just started as an HCM association, but that's actually just a small part of Amy. That's just one vertical of many that we have. We do the certifications, CVAC, CHTM, our newest certification, the CAP T, and um, and we also, um, let's see, in the C-Res, we have our publications, Amy News, our Journal of Biomedical Instrumentation and Technology. Um, we have online communities, like whoever was saying, the one that like got out of control this morning. That, um, but we have forums where people can ask each other questions. Um, and we have mentorship programs, and we have a job board. Most of the stuff I'm going to talk about today are free to Amy members. So if you're a member, you get access to all of this stuff for free. So we have 10,000 members, but we reach about 55,000 annually. So there are people, let's just say, who are certified but aren't a member, or may listen to a webinar but aren't a member. So we have a fairly big reach. And we are small. We're 45 staff, all based in Arlington, Virginia. I am based in Boston. I am a remote employee there, um, so I travel so much. And then I'm down in the office about once a month. So these are some new resources. So I'm going to go over some resources to help um, that can help with promoting the pipeline. So our first um, an, uh, guide that we created this past year was the succession planning guide. This was created by the Healthcare Technology Leadership Committee. Um, and, you know, obviously there's a, we have an aging workforce. 60% of our population is over the age of 50 right now. So we need to start thinking about those jobs that are going to open up, not just the entry-level ones, but also our long-term managers and 
technicians that have all that historical knowledge that we can't replace. You know, no one is forever, you know, and no one can be panicked when you're, when you're, you know, destiny net says I'm leaving. And I know that there's a lot of been trickling between organizations too, because there are so many open positions. So you should really have a clear roadmap for how you're going to deal with all of that. So um, and it also helps with um, staff retention. When you have a clear succession plan, a, a clear road for promotion, staff is much more happy. So um, having a career ladder is important. And you can kind of do this through the succession planning guide. This is all online, free to Amy members. And it, it, in the back, it has a, um, um, like a worksheet where you can fill out all your staff, what their specialty skills are, what their current role is, what their next role would be, and what is their readiness to move. So depending how you select it, it will turn um, red, green, or yellow. So green would be someone ready to move. Um, yellow, maybe they need a little more training, maybe it's finance or something. Red, um, they're not ready to move. Maybe they don't want a promotion, or maybe they're just someone that you would never promote for whatever reason. Then you can look at the key competencies to the next role. So that's really important, because now your staff member knows what they need to do to get to that next position. It's clear, it's defined. And then um, what training is necessary and what their aspirations are. And I think that's always important. You know, there are some technicians that just love doing bench work and they don't want a manager role, and that's okay. But your succession plan should include promoting someone that doesn't want a promotion. So you need to think through all of that and talk with your staff and know what their goals are. Any questions about this before we move on? So the HTM training guide is the next one. Um, so this was built off of a DMED apprenticeship curriculum. We spent so much time developing that. We didn't want it to go to waste if, um, you know, maybe you can't afford to have an apprentice or it's not the right option for you. So we took the curriculum from that and made it into a student, intern, and volunteer guide. So it's lots of competencies. Um, and this way we know that new BMATs that are green are being trained consistently into a minimum standard. And, um, and, and when you invest in employees, they're more likely to invest and stay with you. So here's an example of what one of the pages looks like. You know, healthcare technology and function for diagnostic general care equipment. So you can see you have the otoscopes, the thomoscopes, and you can see like when they've done their training, if they've demonstrated fundamentals, when they're proficient, and someone can sign off. So this can kind of follow your trainee, co-op, intern, um, or even just a brand new employee that you may have hired that maybe is really green. Um, this goes through everything from regulatory, um, you know, class A, one, two, and three devices, class one, two, three recalls, what, you know, why rec what accrediting organizations are and why they're important. And it goes through all basic equipment as well. And for the more higher level equipment, because this is more for someone's very entry level, it just makes sure that you, they know, you know, where you find it in the hospital, can identify it, know the main function, and some basic stuff. So um, the next thing we did was we got a lot of feedback from the field that for new um, HPM professionals entering the field, there, is, there was no certification option for them. And many people wanted to be certified right out of you know, the two-year academic program. So the CAD T stands for Certified Associate in Biomedical Technology. And now this gives the opportunity from ev for everyone to be certified from the minute that they enter the field. So this, the CBET requires um, four years of work experience if you don't have a degree. So if someone is brand new just in, they don't qualify to even sit for the test until we have two years of work experience, so they need four to actually become certified. Um, the CAB T, the only requirement is a GED or high school diploma. So everyone um, can take this now if they want. And it's five years. So and you can't renew it on like the CBET. So the thought process is someone brand new entering the field or interesting or interested in entering the field, take this, get certified. It's good for five years. And regardless of what their pathway is, when that expires in five years, they are eligible to take their step. So that's the progression. And then the next progression would be the management certification, which is the ACM. And we found a good correlation that people who get certified early in their career are more apt to stay certified throughout their career. So we're getting them in the habit early. And we've actually had a lot of success. On, um, I got a couple emails from hospitals the other week saying that they had some nurses that wanted to become um, going to the biomed department and some clinicians. 
in, so they had them take this first to see if they met the minimum knowledge competencies and they passed. So it's also great for employers that you can know if they meet that minimum knowledge competency to work in the field. Um, and it also is good for people that maybe think, well, maybe I don't, maybe I, you know, that are nervous, they don't think they know enough to come into the field, they can take this. And there's a few people that have gotten a lot of confidence um, by taking it first. So it can be used for a lot of, um, a lot of good reasons. And if you, and as a hiring manager, if you see this, you know that, you know, you can feel more confident in hiring them if they're not completely, you know, clueless about it, that they know they have minimum competencies in anatomy and physiology, problem solving, medical devices, um, general IT and general electronics. So it tests all of that. Any questions about this before I move on? There is. We have a BMAT 101 course online. It is all interactive, and you can get the prep guide for this. And that BMAT 101 course can also be used um, if you just have someone really green and you want to just have them do a crash course in the HCM. Oh, actually, this is actually, so this is BMAT 101. So um, it's geared towards people who have a limited experience. You can kind of see, like, it's all interactive. So these are actually, like, flashcards. You would flip on them, and it would tell you, you know, what kind of simulator it is. Um, and it, it goes through these six modules. So it assumes that they know nothing. It tells them what a BMAT is, what they do, what their primary function is in the hospital. Um, safety, regulatory anatomy, electronics, and medical devices. And the medical device section is very high level. It's basically being able to identify um, the medical device, you know, from a picture, knowing how it's used clinically and where you would find it in the hospital. Absolutely. So, oh, that's what I forgot to mention about the CAD-T. Unlike the CDET, the CAD-T is on demand. You could take it right now if you wanted to. It's all online proctored. So you sit down, there's some person on the other end, they have you like show the laptop around you to make sure you're not cheating. They sit there and watch you while you take it. So you can do it. So even if you had someone in an interview and you wanted to test them right then and there, or you were unsure, you wanted them to go take it and come back, they can set it up to do that. Yes. I will do this. <laughs> Some people were talking about using it that way. Like, if they weren't sure, you could ask them to do it. I mean, it's, you know. So, HTM in a box. So, I was going to demo this for you all. Um, so, first and foremost, so we've got a lot of feedback. Obviously, the pipeline is the bane of everyone's existence. Finding good people, keeping them. Uh, we have about, you know, a 15% vacancy rate in the field right now. So that's, you know, that's pretty large, you know. And with the HTM schools, I was saying this morning, there are 67 two-year BMAT programs left in the country. Many of them are in danger of closing. And there are 19 states in the country that don't have one at all. So that is very concerning. So the key takeaway is we need to get out, promote the field, and support your local two-year program before we lose even more. I've spent a lot of time writing um, letters to deans asking them not to close their programs, but you know, obviously that's not enough. Um, one second, I'll answer your question in a minute. Um, you know, schools are, you know, also need to make revenue, and when they're told you need to cut your lowest revenue program, and that's the BMAT program, that's what's happening. So you know, Amy needs quarterly with all of the HTM educators at all of the, at all of the two-year um, colleges with that specific program. And we try to support them the best they can. When they had to suddenly go virtual, we gave them access to our seed up study guide for free so their students could do something at home. Um, so they just, you know, so we've done a lot to try to support them as much as we could. And just, you know, to get a better pulse, some of the educators have also expressed that they've been seeing a large dropout rate of CMAT. They start do their first year and then don't come back. And even though you get that enrollment up front, their graduation rate is small. And between all the schools, we have less than 300 uh, BMEX graduating a year. That doesn't include the military. Um, separate from the military, 300. And we need about 5,000 um, to replace the aging workforce that we're seeing in the next three to five years. So it's so important that we get out there because people see doctors, nurses, teachers, dentists, 
but we are so behind the scenes. People don't know we exist, and people don't grow up saying, I want to be a bee matter, a clinical engineer, you know? Most of us probably found this by accident, so it's kind of a call to action that we need to get out there, and, you know, and for the areas that don't have schools, if we create a need, hopefully we can open more up. Do you have a question? So the easiest way, we can email htm at amy.org. I, I check that. That's me. I email. I check that email box. So that's the easiest way. Just email that. Um, send me that information, and I'm happy to reach out. Add them to the educators call. I know Doug used to be on our educators call, too. Um, and um, we also meet face-to-face. -face. We do an educators luncheon at the... Um, at the exchange as well, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, congratulations. Yeah. That's the problem. COVID killed a lot of the program, too, because I think, you know, part of the challenge, too, from what the educators have conveyed is that, you know, they thought, you know, a lot of the VMAP came in thinking they'd be in hospitals working on equipment, and then when the pandemic hit, all non-essential personnel were sent home, which included the students and interns. They couldn't do their internship, and then it was pure book work, and I think they became frustrated or it wasn't what they thought, so now we saw this huge dropout rate, and that's not helping either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know that's the problem. We, I mean, I probably got like eight or ten. I've probably written a ton of letters, talked on the phone with deans, and told them how essential our field is, and there was nothing that we could do. And we even had other people in the field locally write letters, and they weren't having it. So all we can do is generate interest. Yes, Dr. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And thank you for all you do to develop our future generation of these camp professionals. Absolutely. And we're always happy to support you, whatever you need to do. Awesome. So I was going to demo this really, really quick. So this can be found on the, the card that I handed out if you like this and want to use this. So this came from a suggestion from the field. But basically, you know, it takes a lot of time to make a nice PowerPoint presentation. And a lot of, you know, you, you all are busy, and it takes a lot of time to do that. So basically, we took away all the work. All you have to do is set up um, an appointment at your local middle school, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Hosta Association, um, high school. And we have everything and all the tools that you need to promote the field. Um, this is called HTM in a Box, the virtual box. We also have career brochures, um, HTM FAQs. Um, on the site, we have talking points for people that don't feel as comfortable to 
talking on the fly about this. Um, and what's great is it's really scalable. If you're talking to an electronic um, program, you can focus on the BMAT career. If you're talking to a biomedical engineering program, you can focus on the clinical engineer occupation. Um, and what we did was we created three different presentations. They all convey the same thing. Um, but um, how we say the message is very different. So we'll quickly go through the middle school one, and then I'll go through the adult one. And then the high school one is more, uh, is more there's some of the photos and stuff we show, like iPhones, products, the things that um, high school students care more about to really grab their attention. So we took a lot of time. This was vetted by, like, over 50 different people. A lot of people helped contribute to this. So let me see if I can minimize this. And this isn't my computer, so. Let's be really quick while we're, these are the career brochures. Um, so this is the adult one, Managing Technology, Saving Lives. We have a lot at the EME headquarters. If you send me an email, I'm happy to mail you a stack of them so you can hand them out physically. And then over to the right is our middle school or elementary school brochure. We talk about um, HTMs being healthcare heroes and um, medical equipment doctors. Um, and we have a listing of all of the HTM schools by state as well. So no matter what your state is in, you can be armed with what schools are nearby. Um, and then we even have a, a, someone else that suggested doing an email script for um, cold calling a school for an email script. So you can just literally cut and paste it, change your name, um, and you know, email those for schools. So hopefully you have everything you need to be successful at this. So it's really fun. I've done the presentation quite a quite a few times, and let me see if I can bring up the internet. So I'm just going to walk you through how to do this. So just, Amy, put HTM in a box. I know it's really, like, blurry up there, but that's what I type. And then you can come here, and this is everything is right on this page. Um, the talking points, tips, and scripts for contacting schools, um, HTM specific academic programs by state, the career brochure. So then you just click on this, and it'll bring you over to Prezi, which is um, which is kind of like a PowerPoint on steroids if you've never seen it. It's really interactive. So then what you do is you come in here. Oh, one second. Yeah. It just, we just ask so we can track how many people are using it. So we can actually measure numbers. We aren't going to contact you or anything. So here it is loading. So we'll start with the middle school one. You just click on that, and it's very useful looking, right? So we kind of, I'm not going to go through it as if I'm presenting it, because you all know what HTM is, so I'm just going to quickly run through it for you all. Let's see, ever heard of healthcare technology management? We are machine doctors and technology experts. And these are all real people from our INHTM campaign, so they're not like models or anything like that. Um, you know, um, one person actually at the CMA said when they talked to children, what they want the most is wearing the, the bunny seats. They bring them in, they get them excited. You have to put this on to go in the OR, and that really gets their attention. So we talked about wearing hard hats and scrubs. Um, and then we actually had help making this um, from a hospital and college. In the background of this is all medical device sounds at the front back. We haven't added any music in. Um, the VA let us record some sounds. So the infusion pump blows up. Here we go, we're going to transition to our superhero outfit and fix the infusion pump. You guys are working really hard to fix it. <laughs> it's all better. See, it's fun with people, right? And that's who um, Laura Mainland Biomedical Team helped us make this, so. Um, and then, you know, these have it really, you know, basic, because this is really for elementary, like, grades, maybe kindergarten through, like, fourth or fifth grade. Um, and then what do we do? So we keep it really simple. We work with cool equipment, help people get better. We help doctors and nurses solve problems, and it's really fun. 
Um, and then what jobs can you have? We just talk about the BMAT and the clinical engineer here because, you know, at, a, at that age, they're not thinking of a career trajectory. They want to know what they're doing every day. So you have your BMAT, here's what they do. How can you become a BMAT? Again, this is thinking that they're in elementary school. So we're talking about going to a technical high school, things like that. Um, and your clinical engineer, again, STEM high school, um, and then how they can learn more. It's quick and, you know, because you don't want to lose their attention. And then if we move over to the college and beyond, this is like adults or even seniors of high school you could use this for. So what they, as you can tell, this looks very different now. It's much more, it, you know, it's not as useful looking. We have much more complex technology and pictures. We talk about it being like the personnel at the backstage of a rock concert, getting everything ready for showtime. That's how what we are in the hospital. Um, and again, this is what we do, everything about it. We you know, put really sophisticated equipment like the surgical robot, um, talking about disaster planning, risk management, obviously things that really affected us this past year, knowing how involved we get. Um, YHTM, so obviously we all know why. And then here in the high school, when we work in the HTM manager and director to show that there's a career trajectory. Um, and we talk about salaries in this one as well. Um, and how do you become a DMAT? So we talk about all the different options. We even have a section for related fields and degrees. So if someone wants to be a career changer, depending who you're talking to. Um, I, in Boston, I've been working with the African Group Network, so all immigrants that come over from predominantly Africa, but other countries too, um, that have other degrees. So we've been presenting the DMAT field to them um, as having lateral careers. Some of them have really technical degrees, but they have trouble finding work here because they don't always, um, you know, recognize their degree as equal, and many of them had no idea this was a field. Um, the clinical engineer, how you can become one, what they do, how that differs from the BMAT. Um, let's see. And then the HTM manager and director. And again, all these salaries are from the 24 by 7 survey. I update them every year as the salary survey comes out and changes it. Um, and then these are just the certifications. Some people care about that, so we have a slide in there. And then the working environment, obviously you work in everywhere from you know, operating room, lab, construction site, patient care floors. Um, and then, you know, this is all the different, you know, equipment that we work with and technology. We walk through a typical day in the life. We come in at 7 a.m. and follow up on trouble calls from the night before. Um, we, um, 8 a.m., we'll go to a safety meeting. And how we chose this was no matter what your role is, whether you're a BMAT clinical engineer or director, you'll have some role in this, but what you may do may be different. Um, then we do hospital rounds at 10, at 12, a water pipe break from the OR, have to go study the equipment. Um, at 1 p.m., we'll go to an emergency management meeting to discuss the flood. At 2, we'll go to a project meeting for a brand new suite of the ER being built. At 3 p.m., we follow up on trouble calls, document our work. And at 3.30, we call it a day. So that's kind of, I know our days are longer, but we don't want to scare people away. So we kept it an eight-hour work day for the for the sake of this presentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then we have a different video for the um, adults. It's the same background track, but it shows all the different types of medical equipment and test equipment. You'll see like a test flung in here. The VA let us come in and film their equipment. We weren't allowed to film people. So that's why there's no, um, there's no people in there. You might like my hands in there and stuff, but and there's the test one. Okay, I'm going to skip through it just for the sake of time, but you kind of get the picture. And then, you know, it kind of talks about what attributes you should have as a person, if this career would be good for you, um, and then how you can learn more. So that's each cam in a box. Hopefully you find it useful. Again, just go to amy.org forward slash each cam in a box. You can access all the materials right here on this site. Um, and if you do use it, please take pictures. We love seeing pictures of you all in the field. Um, and we'll share it on social media and stuff. And has anyone asked, have you guys heard of this before? Or have you it? There you go. So now let me see if I can get this back.
Yeah, I think I see new ones. We have updated the book with like to kind of make it all match. So um I need to so that gate can't help me. Alright, so I want to put that. Oh, so we got sorry. Sorry, you can tell it's a process too, so <laughs> Um, let's see. My accent has gotten better over the years, though. So, so. Um, HTM outreach. So we've done a lot of outreach with HTM in the block. So we attended the uh, ASCA, which is the American School Counselors Association. That's the National Association for High School Guidance Counselors. So we've done a lot of work with them. Um, you know, I presented in their Careers You Should Know About segment um, the past three years. I also, the Biomedical Engineering Society, obviously that's this is a career pathway for biomedical engineers that they might not know about. So I've also presented in the BNES's um, career you should know about, um, career opportunities in biomedical engineering that you should know about. Uh, we also took out an ad in the Back to School magazine for ASCA, which is like um, Guidance Counselors Association. Um, we've done a lot of association you know, outreach um, with ASHI, OR Today. We published an article in USA Today. Um, we've also worked with HOSA. And if you haven't heard of them, I would highly recommend you find your local chapter. So HOSA is the Health Occupation Students Association. They will be at our conference in San Antonio and we'll have a table in the vendor area. So I would recommend go meet them, talk to them. So they predominantly, they have members from middle school, high school, and college. But the predominant um, demographic of people that are in that association are high school students that are interested in a career in healthcare. So it's very broad. But it's a great way to let them know if you don't get into nursing school or medical school, maybe you want to do this, you know, it, it's, you know, or just to let them know that it's another career pathway um, for them. So we're actually going to be at their, their conference in Nashville in June as well. Um, we have some people, some volunteers are going to help us staff the table. We're going to bring some equipment, do some demos with the kids, and let them know that this is a career pathway. But every state has a local chapter except for Wyoming. So it's a great way your local biomed associations can partner with them, um, just, you know, with their local events and conferences to help promote this work. And a lot of people don't know that they exist. Um, so I just like to mention it. And we've been doing a lot of work. We've also worked with Europe. They are, they are an association that um, works with um, underprivileged socioeconomic children, mostly in inner cities. And what they do is they train them in different career pathways. Um, and the goal, you know, they, they teach them, you know, um, how to have a dress. Like, um, like a lot of these um, people that are in this group, like, have no means to go to school. Many of them are high school dropouts, but they want to set them up on a career pathway. So they have an IT pathway already. They're piping people into IT, medical device manufacturing. And I said, well, you know, we're like the hybrid of that. You know, you can come. So we're trying to work with them to see if we can get a program so we can get some students trained um, and, and help out in that respect. So the biggest problem, though, is that um, they need places to place these students because the goal is that they get a job at the end. So it can't just be like an internship. It has to be like an internship to hire, which is hard at the hospitals. I know it's so hard with budget. But we're, we're working that through, and, and the lady was just like, wow, I never knew this existed, and was kind of overwhelmed about all we do and how we would get them trained. But it's just another pathway and opportunity to spread the word um, and to increase diversity in the field and give everyone equal opportunity. Um, yeah, we work with all the biomed associations, obviously, the educators that we talked about, um, and we've done a lot of work with the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts as well nationally. We have our IMHCM campaign. You can see some of the people we featured. If you have standouts on your team, we love to show the many faces of HCM and the many stories of how we all got here. So the point is to promote the field, not you know your organization. We ask that they're vendor agnostic. We will tag you and where you work. That's how we'll, but not. Um, but it's it's really to promote the field to people who don't know what the field is. Um, and we've also done a lot of other stuff. We've done a core, we have our core competence guides for HTM ed, academic programs. We have the HTM manual. Um, we've done TM compliance and definitions and emergency preparedness guide. Are there any questions about that segment before I move into the BMAT apprenticeship, which is a whole other beast that I'll go through? So I'll make sure I'm staying on time. 
right, any questions before we move on? All right. So I'm sure many of you have heard, um, Amy has started a national GMAT apprenticeship um, through the U.S. Department of Labor. This was a huge undertaking. It was presented by a technician named Maggie Burke at our ATM Shark Tank in 2019. And everyone thought it was such a brilliant idea. We've had a lot of buy-in from the field. We just started it this year. It took a year and a half to get it up and running, working with the, with the Department of Labor. But the good news is we've done all the paperwork for you. You don't have to work with the Department of Labor. We've done it. You work through us. And anyone can do this. So for those of you who aren't familiar with apprenticeship, um, ours is a two-year hybrid program, meaning it's time and competency gain. They need to have and meet all the competencies that are defined and also work two years along with other related instruction that does that does require a few college courses and we'll talk about that um and what we did was we wanted to we realized that not everyone has the opportunity to go to school at every point in their life forever so now this gives everyone an opportunity to be an entry level BMAT. and i just want to be clear when you're done this program you are a BMAT one if not, if you want a trajectory, you know, we do say you, you may need to you go back to school. So this is to get you in the door, get you with a great career to start, and then we set them up with some college credit so hopefully they will go back to school afterwards. But it starts them with a great career. And you can require anything you want. Amy wrote the minimum standard. You can require anything above and beyond that. So if you want them to complete a degree along with it, you can. But from the perspective of Amy, the way we wrote it, um, it doesn't require the full degree, but there are, and I'll go through all the requirements. Um, I actually got a call from the University of Cincinnati that he wants to, he has a bunch of biomedical engineers, and he wants them to do this program along with their degree. So they're going to start doing that. So there's lots of ways to do this creatively, um, and you can make it whatever works for you um, in your individual environment. I am the head of the apprenticeship. So as long as you're working through me and I know what you're doing, um, you'll have no issue going through it as long as you're following all like legal labor laws. And obviously, there's some stuff that we'll talk through that has to be done. Um, Mike, actually, from HFS, hired the first high school apprentice in the country. He's, and this is also written as a youth apprenticeship. And you can do it as a youth apprenticeship. I'm not going to talk a lot about that. But the only difference between the adult one versus the minor one is you need to follow all minor labor laws in your state. They vary from state to state. Like, for instance, in Massachusetts, you can't like, operate a trash compactor if you're under 18. You can't work at 9 o'clock at night. So just know what your labor laws are in your state. Um, and they need to have a parental signature to sign up. Those are the two big differences. They need parental permission because they're minors, obviously. So... Um, and it in, in what this does is we know that organizations all over the country are hiring green DMAT because they're very desperate for people. We've all been there. And we're training them. But now this ensures everyone's being trained consistently into a minimum competency level that's been standardized across the country. So what is apprenticeship? So apprenticeship is a paid job, work-based learning, a mentorship, formal learning, an industry recognized credential. So they will come out with three certifications at the end of this and some college credit. Um, and basically, you know, it shows perspective to your the people that you're hiring that you're meeting national quality standards for BNET. And this is all built off of the core competency guide that the HCM or BNET academic programs use to build their programs to so we aligned it. So, the, so I'm going to break down each one individually. So you have your paid jobs. These apprentices work for you. You want to do this. You sign up through Amy, and then you're an approved apprenticeship partner. Then you go out and hire the people. We, have, we don't get involved with that. You find the right fit for your organization and the right employee that you need. So you go through your HR like you would hire anyone else. You would bring them in lower than a, uh, the salary, lower than the beam at one. The only requirement is that you can make at least the minimum wage in the state that you're employing them in. Um, and let's see. And then you can require anything else. If your organization requires flu shots or whatever, you know, background check, drug testing, you can require whatever you, what you want of them um, when you hire them. 
And then the only requirement from the Department of Labor is that they receive one raise throughout their two years. And you can determine how and when they get that raise. And the thought process is that as they're training and learning, they become more valuable. They can do more work. On day one, you wouldn't let them probably, you know, touch an infusion pump. But, you know, by year two, hopefully they can do that independently. Do you have a question? I'd have to ask the Department of Labor if that happens. But I, I'm, I'm your liaison. So when you run into those problems, I have a specific person at the Department of Labor that is dedicated to this. So I can even get them talking with your HR or, but yeah, any questions like that. But I, I don't know, the, I've never had that happen yet. But yeah, we should, I, can, I can follow up and ask. Um, and the big thing, 94% uh, of apprentices will stay at the organization that they were trained in because they feel like you invested in them, so they feel indebted to you and they have a loyalty to you. So work-based learning. So what does that mean? So there is over, there's 14 pages of competency that the apprentices will learn over the um, two years that they're working for you. They should be set up with a mentor, and we'll talk about that. You define who that mentor is. It can be multiple people. You can have someone teaching them OR, someone else doing comp, monitoring, IT. And it's broken out into hospital orientation and safety. It goes through everything from recalls, regulatory, all different types of medical devices, um, basic IT, um, communication skills, professional skills. The biggest bulk is your biomedical equipment technology. That's all the different types of equipment that they'll find in the hospital getting exposure. And you need to meet the, the curriculum 80% as written. So there is flexibility. Like, for instance, the VA doesn't have labor and delivery, so we won't count that against them. Or maybe your lab is completely outsourced and you don't have the ability. That's fine. And you can always add on anything above and beyond that's not written. So if you're training your dialysis tech of the future and you want to focus them on that, um, you, you could do that in theory. So a radiology technician, anything specialized. So you can write in anything else for the competency. And what's really great is they're being trained in your organization, in your culture, on your tools, and on your specific equipment. So you're not having to retrain them. Because when they're done, they've trained with you. So the mentorship we kind of talked about, they will get paired up. Um, the Department of Labor calls mentors journey workers. It sounds really fancy, but it's nothing more than a mentor. You define who those are. It's anyone you feel capable of training them. Um, you just can't have more apprentices than you have journey workers. So if you're a small department of three people, you can have more than three apprentices. Um, and then, let's see. And then, yeah, that's really it with the mentorship. And then there's the is there any questions up to this point? I know it's a lot of information. And if anyone's seriously interested, I am happy to set up calls and go over it with your organization one on one. Um, so then there's formal learning. So this is like your extra learning that's done outside of work hours. And again, that's at your discretion. If someone wants to watch a webinar during lunch, or you know, you're sending them to a service school, you know, or they're letting them come here, for instance, you know, that's at, at your discretion but they should be doing a lot of it after hours. So the Department of Labor requires 144 hours of formal learning each year, so 288 hours total. Um, and you can follow your own reimbursement policy, so we're going to go over what's required. Um, and then um, you get six college credits. There's two college courses that are required. And education is non duplicative So if you hire someone with a degree already, maybe they have a degree and I don't know, and I don't know, something related, and they've already taken college math, they don't need to repeat it. So it's all non duplicative and there's no expiration date. So you can get a career changer as well. So if people have college degrees, I usually have them send me their transcripts, and I let you know what of that 144 hours they've already completed, because you don't need to pay for that again. So or we've also had, um, there's actually a um, uh, a third-party um, ISO on the West Coast that has an apprentice, and he actually started his biomed degree and dropped out for family reasons. And he said, well, since you don't have a degree, I want you to go through the apprenticeship. So he got almost like a year of credit because he's done a lot of the work already. So if you find people with some already training, um, we can fast-track them through the program. And again, we would just work with me on that as well. 
So this is the first year. You do your OSA 10 training. That's required at most hospitals. Um, your two college courses in anatomy and physiology and college math, they can pick whether they want to take algebra or calculus. It doesn't matter to me what they take as long as they're taking a college math. Um, they need to do 15 hours in electronics. That can be um, learning online. You can send them to a college course if you want them to do that. Um, there's free courses online that will get you um, the training. And then, so for the first and second year total, there's 70 hours of medical equipment training from industry sources. So that we left that really vague because if you want to build, let's just go back to the dialysis tech. You, if you have the budget, you can send them to a service school. That would count. Or, you know, this would count as their training. They're here, they're learning. You decide, they can watch webinars. You can, again, you require what they do. Yes. That would count if they've already done that. They, 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 so it's 30 hours the first year and 40 the second year, so 70 total. If they've already done that through a college, I mean, you just, just check them off. I just need their transcripts as proof, and they had to at least gotten a C in the course. Or, you know, the, the going back to that ISO, if he had hired him first and he had gone to a service school, so we just used that as well. So, it, so and I did figure out minimum cost is about, if you, like, can do this for free, let's just say they come to the MD Expo or they watch webinars at 70 hours and they already have the training, you can get away with doing um, their education for under $2,000. So it's not that expensive. It sounds like a lot. Um, and then they finish their first year taking the tab T, and then um, they can, and then their study counts for 30 hours. You do not have to buy anything from Amy. I am not here to sell you anything. I'm not a salesperson. I don't want to sell. So, um, but, you know, they can study from a book, and that counts for the 30 hours, or you can, we have a course if you want to purchase it. But again, it all depends on your budget and what you want to do. I just want to help with work, so I'm not here to sell anything at all. So, um, and then for the college courses, the College of Biomedical Technology, the online school in Texas, they, um, they love this program, and they're partnering with us. Um, they're offering all their courses at a discount, so if people, um, you know, if people don't want a brick and mortar school, you can do that. I also recommend please support your local biomed program, support Dr. O'Rear if you're doing us. Uh, have them use his classes so his program can stay up and running. And hopefully, the goal is hopefully they'll take your classes, love it, and join your program full time. So, um, so yeah. And then they get two hours for taking the test. And you can follow your own reimbursement policy. So you don't have to pay to have them take and fail those 10 times. Same thing with the college courses. You can tell them that, like, you need to be serious. You pay up front, but you reimburse them. So the only requirement from the Department of Labor is when they're done, they haven't paid for any of this out of pocket. They've been reimbursed, but they can pay up front. And then here's the second year. We know IT is so important. They get 40 hours for studying for their IT fundamentals, two hours to take the test. Again, they can study from a book. You can purchase something from them. Totally up to you. They need to communicate nine hours of communication and personal, person, uh, professional development. I'm sure most of your hospitals have something like that anyway. That would count. Again, your medical equipment training from industry sources. And then they end with taking and passing the test. And they can study on their own or they can purchase a course. We have the activities. So that's the two-year program. And the certifications are kind of a check and balance system that they're being trained properly. If they're being trained well at your facility, they should be blue tests. Any questions about that? Yes, yeah, so they'll be in candidate status. They are not a full CBET. But we, if they are enrolled in the um, apprenticeship, they are allowed to take it in candidate status. And then they need a four full years of work experience. So if you hire someone, you know, they may or may not, depending if there's someone with tax. Um, I think that's it for that course. Any other questions? Yes. He does. He's employed by us. Yes. Yeah. So the CETA e-learning and smart practice are, aren't based course. There are two separate online courses. One is like 
uh, a practice test, and the other one is um, a product from an amplifier. So basically, it's like it's an online course that that teaches you differently. So it's really how you prefer to learn. The amplifier course focuses on different ways of learning, and there are some scientists that discovered that that is a tool that. If you get an answer wrong and someone tells you the correct answer right away, you don't retain it because you're so focused on the fact that you got the question wrong. So that um, smart practice actually takes that into account. So it has you test out and then it, it teaches you what you got wrong later. And it also there's two totally different so they're two totally different online types of learning. And then Dave Scott also teaches a virtual like online Zoom course, and you can, that would you can do that too. It's however the student prefers to learn. Or if they prefer just taking textbooks and reading through resources, that's cool too. But they pass the test and assume they, they studied for 50 hours. So, yes. It does, yep. If they do not have a degree, they need four years of work experience. So if you hire someone with an electronic degree or something, they may, but we're going to assume that this person is green. So they would not. They would be in, in, Yes. Yes. They may get their four years. Yes. Exactly. So everyone will be a little different. But at minimum, they will be in candidate status. And once they get their work experience, then they become a full student. So then we have some, um, you can just like how the training is delivered. Fluke Biomedical offered out all of their advantage training. That's 22 hours of free training online. Talks about all the test equipment, electrical safety. So you could use a lot of that for free for the first year. Um, and then, again, you can scale up to what you want. I talked about the College of Biomedical Equipment Technology. And there's lots of free training and lots of industry support. So I don't know. Is anyone from the Volvo in the room? Someone was supposed to come to me. Anyway, so if you're an in-house HPM program, the Volvo has offered for the first seven health systems, they pay for the certifications for up to two apprentices. So we know budgeting is an issue for hospitals. So they will reimburse your hospital, and that's very generous of Navolo. So, um, if, so that even lowers your cost. You won't have to pay for the certification. So we'll do the first seven hospitals or health systems, um, and up to two apprentices there. And then portable credentials. Obviously, you get the two Amy certifications and the IT fundamentals. And, you know, when we talk about the two years of training, I mean, if they don't want to take two college courses the first year, they can take one the first year, one the second year. At the end of two years, all we care about is that they've done it all. It doesn't matter when they did it. Um, and, and, yeah, so that's really, and then, yeah, so, and then, why would you want to do this? We have a career pipeline. Um, I have over 400 people that want to do this program that are completely green, but we don't have enough employers to place them. So I know you all are having trouble hiring. Amy has the pipeline for you if you're willing to make that investment and go through that with us. Um, I'm not allowed to share their names if you're not part of it because that's like soliciting. So you have to be part and registered through us to do it. But I can tell you there's 400 people all over the country. So um, if you're interested in doing it, I can let you know how many people in the area that you are in to make sure there's people. But, um, and you can hire your own people. You don't have to. Our list is just to help you. There's no requirement. I, I basically just ask their basic information, how many, if they have any experience, how they heard about the field, if they're willing to relocate. Um, but if you have an incumbent worker that you're already training and you just want to transition them into this, you can do that too. You can hire your own people. There's no, you know, you don't have to use any of those 400 people if they're not a good fit. And you would still have to do them and everything. So there's, you can tailor your training to meet your needs, increase retention. There is grant funding available at the state level. So when you register nationally through us, you don't register through your state. There's a lot of confusion. It's a national program, not a state program. But that doesn't change your ability to get grants from the state. So what you would do is you'd register. I send you our national registration number, your apprentice's registration number, and then you go to your workforce development office. And you can get every state is different what they offer. Some will cover some training. Some will cover uniforms and tools. 
There's also a lot of funding out for veterans. They want to help veterans through apprenticeship programs and career changes. So there's also um, a lot available for veterans if you hire them into an apprenticeship. Um, there's It varies from state to state. So for the veterans, they will actually, so what's really cool in some of the states for the veterans, let's just say take a, BB, uh, a beam at one makes $20 an hour, and you hire them on at 10. So the, the VA grants will pay that other $10 an hour so that they're making what the minute the, the entry level salary is. So some will cover it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. It would, yeah, and I can find out who the, the Workforce Development Office, the contact in your state, and we can see what they offer. And it changes all the time, just because they don't, so um, the government just put in, like, I think it's like 20, $20 billion towards apprenticeships over the next five years. They want to invest. Um, so there's money everywhere now um, that you wouldn't have access to if you weren't doing that. And I know I can put you also in touch with Sam Jock at McMorrin Health. He has five apprentices. And she's been working through the state of Michigan. It's gotten a ton of funding. So um, it's working out well for her. Um, and she, she was only going to do two, and they covered so much she hired more. So, um, so yeah, it really varies from state to state, though, and I, I don't know the ins and outs of every state, so, but we can figure that out if you're interested. And then you get your e credentials, um, you know, industry-recognized credentials. So we've got all the... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. You said that. So anyone you feel comfortable training, um, you can be a journey worker. It is anyone that's a journey worker has to take a free online sexual harassment course through the Department of Labor, but other than that, um, yeah, so whoever you feel comfortable. And, like, you can have multiple journey workers even just for one apprentice. You know, if you feel like, you know, you couldn't train on anesthesia, but someone else can, you know, so. Um, so, yeah, so high retention. We've done all the paperwork. You don't have to work through the Department of Labor. There's just some forms you would need to fill out working through me, saying that you agree to abide, that you're going to pay your employees, that you know that they, they have to come out debt-free. Um, and, yeah, high retention. And, obviously, there's a savings to your organization. And these are a lot of our apprenticeship partners right now across the bottom. And it really increases diversity because now everyone has the opportunity to become a DMAT. People that never thought they could go to school can now get into a really great career. Um, and so now it's 400 plus. And you can do it with your current employees. So if you have an incumbent worker, like you, maybe you can't make a new FTU position, but maybe you have a trainee already on staff and, you know, you want them to have like a formal certificate. So at the end, we'll get a certificate from the Department of Labor and a jointly sign that we've both signed off on them, that they've met our minimum standards and competencies. And that's good to go with them wherever. So, and it's also transferable. So, like, let's say they started at your organization and they left. If your organization wanted to finish it, they could. You could, you know, the Department of Labor just cares that they've met all the requirements, not where they do it. But, you know, obviously it's hard to transfer because not everyone may have it approved at their organization. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So that's what we'll do. And like, yeah, so as long, so what I tell them is, yes, it is transferable, but there has to be a position open where you're going or a hospital that's part of the program. So we can't guarantee, but they can start it back up at any point. So again, the Department of Labor does it, nothing expires that you do, so they could start it later. So, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, so, and that's it. So any questions about that? That was a lot of information. Thank you. Done a lot of work over the past couple of years. Thank you. We're just here to help, so whatever we can do to help you all. Any questions? If not, 
You think, oh, it's 345. Look at that. I did it right for God. Look at that. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Enjoy. And if you guys need anything, then you can always email me at hkm at amy.org.